Hello, everybody, and welcome to this short and I hope interesting talk called uh, Open for Business. I'm going to explore some of the emerging trends and I guess accelerating drivers around uh, open source, open banking, and what I call the open data ecosystem or economy that's uh, becoming more and more important. My name is Gerald Shotnessy. I'm head of propositions at Nearform. And I want to give you a very brief uh, background on Nearform just for context. So we create software solutions um, and deliver them, support them uh, for enterprises and large organizations. Uh, we also help with capability. And what we mean by that is we help enterprises get to a more modern architecture, set of tools, technologies, um, technologies and governance. Uh, a lot of this is, that is around open source, particularly around the front end. We are lucky in that, I guess, we've been a remote first company that's part of our DNA for the last eight to nine years. And that's helped us to, I guess, not miss a beat during this pandemic. Uh, we've been able to just roll on as normal. We're also very lucky over the last decade or so to have worked with some great clients all around the world and in lots of different sectors and segments. Um, we find that bringing the ideas and experiences from uh, one sector to another is always uh, well received and very useful for our clients. In terms of open source, uh, I think we can justly um, claim to have some creds here. Uh, again, going back to the pioneering days of Node.js, where the company initially um, started a lot of this and have contributed greatly over the years. Uh, in fact, we run NodeConf every year. And right now, um, as I'm speaking, the uh, conference is ongoing, a virtual conference this year, for so two days um, for engineers to and architects to exchange ideas. Uh, around that area. Uh, more recently, we've been working around what we call an approach to the front end we call Polaris, which is a single code base based around React, React Native to deliver solutions to iOS, Android um, and web from a, from a single code base. And I'll speak more about that later because it's relevant to financial services and to open source. And of course, we've used that same approach in the last nine months to deliver COVID tracking apps, national and state uh, apps to nine different jurisdictions. So everywhere from New York and Pennsylvania, Delaware, right through to Scotland, uh, Gibraltar, Ireland, Northern Ireland. So a whole range of states and countries. Um, the, the open source around that uh, and the tools and the technologies we've used has been donated. Uh, we've donated it to the Linux Health Foundation under the name of COVID Green. So if you look on GitHub um, slash COVID Green, you can find the code there. We're hoping that will help to uh, a lot of um, countries or states to, in the fight against COVID. Our engineers uh, love to engineer and love to collaborate, and they have over the years uh, created their own products, which are in use in the open source community, uh, products like Fastify, which would be very well known. So I guess we're a software company. We do have a lot of background in open source and we do uh, use open source in the projects wherever it's appropriate. Okay, so looking at open banking and what the context is here, uh, this is my own slide. I, I did work in banking technologies in the 90s and saw some of the move from legacy and monolithic uh, bank IT into digital banking. To step back a little bit from that, I'd say that the the early moves into digital banking very much have been to the benefit of banks. It's a more efficient way to deliver services than true physical branches. And that has spurred on a lot of the move to web. It's actually been yeah, easier and cheaper for banks to do it that way. And it's certainly at the start of using application programming interfaces or API banking, and I'll, I'll explain some of that in a while. Certainly, certainly part of that is to benefit banks as well and actually getting access to their own data. More and more though, and it's hard to believe this is only since about 2015 because it made such a big impact. We've seen the emergence of external market factors which are affecting uh, retail banks in particular for now. Uh, so the, the famous and, and um, well-known digital channel uh, challenger banks or neo banks like Revolut and Starling and N26 are taking off and have already um, gained millions of customers and, and billions in funding between them. And it's an external threat. Some people would say they're not banks, they're more like digital wallets, but certainly 
Um, it's a threat to retail banking in that they own a lot of the front end experience and are gaining ground rapidly. What we're talking about more today is the open banking regulation, which is um, uh, coming out around the world, uh, allowing uh, bank customers to grant access to their account data and payments data to third parties. And that's really interesting. I think that these external factors are gaining momentum and a lot of ideas that were theoretical in the future are now happening um, through this new um, open data uh, economy and that we're moving into a new banking ecosystem and we'll take a look at it. The, let's look at open banking first. So any proponents of this or any evangelist for open banking would immediately say it will drive innovation. So a customer being able to get new products and services based on their existing financial data. Um, but I've seen a lot of changes come technology changes and regulation changes over the years. And I always ask myself the same questions. Will it really lead to real change? Um, is it going to impact? And, and the questions I tend to ask are, is it really going to be available on a global scale? Um, are there use cases that make sense to me and to you? Um, and are there big benefits? In some cases, I say, show me the money. If you can see that there's benefits and money to be made, then that often drives. It's a marketplace uh, driven innovation. So um, let's look at the, the availability first. Um, and it, we don't have to understand all of this map, but I guess the darker the color, the more um, <clears throat> in place regulations are. And if we look at say the UK and Europe since 2018, uh, the legislation is finished, the open banking is in place and there's already a, a um, vibrant ecosystem of fintechs, new fintechs, which are um, offering services based on account data and payments data. That has rolled on through to India and Australia. Um, other countries are developing the regulation um, or considering it. I think North America is very interesting in that it may take time for regulation, full regulation, to come into play for open banking uh, because of the fragmented nature of the banking system. However, you can see in real time that some of the more progressive banks are already starting to open up their APIs and look for partners to share with because they can see which way the marketplace is going. You can see other um, apps for personal financing and, and budgeting like um, uh, YNAB or Mint, the, they're actually using screen scrape, scraping in some cases, uh, which is an interesting um, way of doing things. They're getting financial data with consent, but it leaves the banks responsible for the data, but not necessarily controlled in all of the data analysis. So I feel that um, in the US, it's actually market demand is starting to move ahead of regulation or won't wait for regulation. We'll start to actually drive out some um, use cases there. Overall, uh, answering the first question, it very much looks to me like the, the ine inexorable drive of democracy over tyranny. It's like open data over closed data. You can see that um, with the movement that's already going on, and the unlikely um, case of ever reversing it, that this will uh, come into play sooner or later in your region, wherever you are, if it's not already there. And around use cases, there are many. Um, let's take a look at a very simple one to start with. Um, right now, insurance providers, in order to assess somebody's uh, financial risk profile and provide the appropriate risk cover and premiums, um, requires a tortuous um, manual uh, to and fro to get all of that information um, from various uh, institutions and compile it and work it out. So even this relatively boring use case, you can see how um, uh, account information can be aggregated through open, an open banking API immediately for that customer's bank accounts, wherever they may be in whatever bank brought together, collated and analyzed. So there are already third party providers offering this service. This is more automation than innovation, but you can see that um, it immediately provides a far, far quicker and easier way to compile a good risk profile, which is a benefit to insurance providers and customers. That's just one use case um, for insurance using account aggregation on open banking APIs. Um, also of interest, and this is one that uh, we, we'd all could identify with. Uh, going to your local retailer, supermarket, Starbucks or Macy's or whatever, and using your card actually triggers a chain of 
um, engagement from various third parties uh, to get that payment completed. And when you look at this kind of a chain, uh, it seems to comply with a lot of the characteristics that would make it open for disruption. First is that they, they, there are only two real parties involved in the value exchange, um, and yet there are so many other parties involved to get the transaction completed, which seems to be uh, not very logical or useful. Um, the second thing is that all of these parties for payment gateways and processors and card networks are taking a fee, and sometimes quite a sizable fee. Um, and this is not necessarily adding tangible benefit to the value transfer, but it's certainly costing both the customer and the merchant in money. And then the last thing I'd see here is that there's actually quite often trust, depending on the nature of your relationship with the merchant. It could be someone that you trust or a merchant or a supermarket that you visit very often. And there's already some brand loyalty and brand trust there. Um, and in that case, um, you would see that it, it, this is ripe for disruption. Um, and if you look at the open payments initiative, uh, that allows right now retailers who are in those areas with, with open payments and open banking already regulated to set up a relationship with the customer whereby they can withdraw the money for the transaction directly from their bank account. So customers, again, just pick it from a point of sale option or from an app and give biometric authentication and the transaction is completed. It gives immediate value to the retailer. It cuts out a lot of the middlemen and the fees and therefore it, uh, that extra value can be used to increase margin for retailers, to reduce cost, costs, or to even reduce the price of the transaction for the customer. So it's a win-win for the two people at the core of the transaction. And it, it's, I'm sure, only a matter of time before this really starts to become more uh, widely spread uh, as a use case. Um, I've started to look recently at press releases from MasterCard where they're starting to, I think, get this about the market and making sure that they're launching open APIs themselves to get into that ecosystem rather than be left out of it um, and acquiring um, fintechs to, uh, again, be part of that new ecosystem. And I think the banks should probably take up, uh, sit up and take note of this kind of activity because actions speak louder than words. This is a value chain that's ripe for disruption and open payments make that, makes that very possible right now. Um, stepping back, what actually gives a lot of the these new innovative products and services uh, fuel is the fact that it's not just that you can technically access this data, it's that the other third party providers can do so and they can bring an extra dimension to the service by combining financial data. So looking at the one we just saw, it's C3 on this diagram the retailer has actually started to build up a financial services relationship uh, with that uh, customer that they didn't have. And you could imagine that uh, that could extend when the trust is there and the channels are set up to point of sale lending where the retailer can actually lend the customer the money to buy the item and pay back over time, uh, which is really interesting. If we look at V1 and this, it's a very simple account aggregation uh, use case, but Interestingly, for retail banks over many years, the single customer view has been a kind of a holy grail to even get one single customer view of their own customers for the accounts in their own bank, which tend to be siloed. What this would do here is it would allow a third party to aggregate all the account information from any bank for that customer or that business and then provide more analysis and more value around that data. So it would kind of uh, almost leapfrog over what banks have been trying to do over the last few years. Really interesting, you start to get into C1 at the mega app. Um, I think this is one is, it becomes more uh, interesting as I go along in this presentation, the idea that an Amazon or a WeChat, which has huge information about its own uh, clients could become one of the third party users and combine financial data along with all the location, personal purchasing and, and um, preference data that they already have. And that would make them very, very powerful um, and actually uh, possibly push banks right to, the, right to the back of the stage in this case. So there's a lot of use cases. I think if we look back there, we can see over the last few slides, there will definitely be global availability of this. It's already rolling out. 
there are some interesting use cases to say the least and possibly um, as these emerge over the next year or two some very compelling use cases for other third parties to start building innovative new products and services around open banking around unbundled banking i guess you call the, the digital banking um, and around open payments so what's the bank's perspective on this because it is quite a, an existential threat i guess um, in fair, and I've worked in bank IT for a number of years, and I know that it's a bit of a cliche to uh, push on the poor banks that they do struggle to roll out new um, uh, services and features, like most uh, uh, larger enterprises or older enterprises. Um, and I know that a lot of banks are trying to move ahead with digital transformation and doing well, normally starting at the, the back end first, I guess. But there is still quite a big shift to turn around in many cases um, and I think that banks that are still struggling with modernizing and moving slowly towards a new um, a more agile digital model will definitely struggle when API banking and open banking rolls out over the next couple of years and these are the things that they need to consider um, so placing in, in terms of modernizing a lot of banks realize that they have a lot of technical debt and uh, outdated legacy backend systems, but rather than take the risk of replacing them all, a core strategy for many banks is to place an application programming interface uh, as an abstraction layer. And that would be the private APIs. A lot of banks are doing this just to get at their own data in a more efficient way. Um, the public APIs uh, would be around the open banking. So the, it's a version of this API, which is available to the public and is enforced by compliance to be there. I've spoken to some colleagues who are still in banking IT and they said that it's taken them so long to get their own APIs working and then to comply with open banking that they haven't really thought any further than this. And I would say to them, this is really important right now. Um, opening up partner APIs on the, it gets, is a chance for banks to get on the front foot and start getting out to find partners in the new, more open ecosystem. Um, if they don't do that, somebody else will, and somebody else will use the open uh, banking APIs to do that. If banks are still slow and saying, look, let's see what the market uh, is going to bring us over the next years before we decide, I would ask this question, which seems an unusual question, but it's, it's around mobile telcos. Um, and then we can see from Financial Times articles over the last while that they have been retrenching, reducing, rationalizing and cutting costs. And you can see the reason quite clearly now, looking back at mobile telcos, while they've generated billions during the 90s and early 2000s, have actually lost the front end to the over the top players like Amazon and Netflix um, and Google and Apple and Facebook, obviously. And a lot of the margin and the value and the experience is happening there in their front end, but on their network, but the, the cash is going to the over the top players. And you might say, how is that relevant? Well, if you look at that, it's a highly regulated uh, industry where the industry has spent years building up the strong infrastructure to support services, but didn't quickly enough get out into the front end experience, let other players get in there who are now taking the core relationships and the margin and leading to, I guess, um, telecom operators becoming um, back end wholesale uh, less relevant providers in their own industry. And you do have to wonder if that could happen in retail banking and happen very quickly. Uh, if we look at some very recent uh, research from Accenture, uh, when talking to, I guess, what they call digitally active or digital mo uh, nomads, um, there's a huge majority, 78% of those who would be quite happy to uh, take banking services from the likes of Google or Amazon. Uh, some would also be happy to share um, their Google, Amazon data with banks, but they would expect a lot more in return from banks and more personalized services. This has always been mentioned, and for a long time, people have said, look, Google doesn't want to be an insurance company, doesn't want to be a bank. But we now see coming from the Wall Street Journal and other places, um, actions, again, speaking loud in words, with Google announcing that they will provide checking accounts, um, with uh, Apple introducing credit cards, um, Amazon talking about checking accounts as well. So this whole theoretical uh, possible future threat is now here. And when you combine that with the likes, the types of regulation around open banking and the expectation around open data in general, uh, I think these changes are going to rapidly accelerate over the next while. So um, 
retail banks in particular need to sit up and take notice of this. The question we often ask around open source and where that fits in here, oh, and particularly in conferences like this in the, in the open source strategy forum, we, we spend a lot of time looking at lighthouse projects where banks have used some open source in some projects and how it is good enough. And the question is, is, is it good enough for banking? And I think that's the wrong question. I think that banks are asking a very internal based question from their side of the, the world saying, is this kind of um, technology good enough? And based on everything that's happening rapidly out in the market, uh, the changes and the ownership of data changing hands, um, the, the question that should be asked much more importantly should be a market based um, question, where is the market going? For banks, they should maybe ask themselves, do we have the technical talent? Do we have the speed and agility to compete in what the open data marketplace is going to look like? And it's not five years from now, it's like 24 months from now. Um, and that's where open source probably comes into this equation more. The this is again, it's from Accenture, it's a great um, illustration of what can happen. We look often at the open data marketplace where um, life events and life moments are spotted on social networks. They're true searches. They could be anywhere in the digital world. Recognizing those moments, um, working with uh, third party um, ecosystems some participants. So that would be a bank who has an open uh, API partnership with insurance or with car finance or with um, any other of those services that match what's happening with the person out in their digital life and being able to be there and be present and offer that combined service in a way that's personalized, relevant and timely. And that would be the living bank. And that is far and away from where a lot of banks are now still struggling with getting basic APIs in place. Other banks are well ahead. A lot of banks are thinking well and, and maybe starting up their own digital challenges to themselves, but not doing this, I believe, uh, would be a major misstep. Uh, doing it will be really interesting and will get banks back out in front, uh, unlike the telecom operators. Again, looking at open source, um, we see the relevance for this is looking at bank challenges and looking at where open source fits. So um, for banks, the ecosystem is growing now. It's not growing next year or the year after. So third party providers are already using banking data to provide uh, interesting new services. Digital challenger banks will go take some of this on. Interesting in, in Ireland, KBC, which would be the third or fourth bank, one of the first things they did on their app uh, was to offer if you had a bank balance with one of the bigger banks, one of the established large legacy banks, they offered to show that balance on their own app, knowing that they maybe only had some of your business, but could now offer you an app, which is more personalized to you. And you can start looking at your Bank of Ireland balance through your KBC app. That's really interesting. Uh, and that's only within the banking sphere. Imagine what third party providers could do with that. The other interesting point here for banks is that while it now looks like data is open and there's an open competition for financial services, it's actually not that clear cut. And what actually is happening is that open banking uh, forces banks to provide account and payments data to the rest of the world, but there is no reciprocal. So um, Google and Amazon and Facebook can now get at uh, account data for customers, but that does not mean that they have to provide any of their um, really important personalized data to the banks. So uh, open banking actually puts banks at a retail banks at a disadvantage. So it's not an even competition. Uh, there's also, and I think this is true in so many spheres, there's been a shift to the front end. So a bank account is a bank account running in the back end. It doesn't feel any different necessarily, whatever system it's running on. But uh, what has been proven time and again, and it's proven even by the digital challenger banks, is that if the front end experience is personalized, if it's slick, uh, if it's interesting and, and uh, offering innovative products, that's where the new battlefield is. And it's not necessarily a strength of banks. Banks tend to lag five or 10 years behind in their front end apps. Even if they're launching new apps, they tend to be siloed and not giving a full customer view, or as I say, a little bit behind. Um, and in this new growing ecosystem, which is very much uh, enabled by new technology, there's a need for banks to have the best technical talent. And this is where open source fully 
fits the frame. Um, the open source community is quite equivalent to the ecosystem that's growing now um, and speaks the language of fintechs. So open banking APIs themselves are open source and a huge amount of the products and services that are developed around it are being developed in open source, which is not just the technology, but also the culture, um, the collaborative nature and sharing of that. And it's much, much easier to do that uh, working with new fintechs if you're working with open source tools and processes than coming from a proprietary backend or closed off system. And open source, let's not forget, dominates the front end. So React and React Native are the most popular um, frameworks or, or approaches for front end, along with things like Angular and Vue. And engineers almost automatically will choose the open source tools that they, they can use. Um, so if you want to work uh, and lead in this ecosystem, which is technolog technologically driven, front end focused, and open and collaborative and moving very rapidly, then open source is necessary. Not so much around the back end proprietary systems of the bank, but definitely around the future front ends. Uh, engineers love to collaborate, and that's why a lot of these open source systems um, attract great engineers and architects who want to collaborate, learn, iterate through, and talk to other engineers, which is essentially what open source facilitates. Uh, just to give an example, uh, I mentioned Polaris earlier on. That's our approach to the front end. So we use uh, in Nearform a React and React Native core and things like GraphQL in the background. But we use that to create um, fully working, great looking apps on Android, iOS, and web using a single code base of React. Um, we recently partnered with IBM to develop an open banking reference app, uh, fully working uh, against open banking accounts and uh, using uh, financial transfers, um, uh, using Polaris, using React, and had the whole thing up and working in four weeks. And that's the same framework we've used for COVID tracing apps. So it shows again that the open source tools in the right hands, using the right way, can create uh, really exciting front end experiences using open banking uh, in and very very rapidly and securely. So just final thoughts. I, again, this is even wider. It's not really just about open banking. It's about open data, and that is growing and growing. So the real. Uh, winners here will be the ones who understand that financial data can be combined with all sorts of other open data um, through APIs and that that's where the next ecosystem is. If you look at say Amazon's dominance of the American market with 80% of households having Amazon Prime, it's just showing that the super app based on getting your data, understanding it and personalizing it is where the world is going. Um, and banks I think have a couple of steps to catch up, uh, retail banks uh, in getting more open source and more open data and more open um, approach to this uh, very quickly. So finally, I guess, um, to come full circle, uh, I think that that result is, if you look at unbundled banking and digital challenging banking uh, coming in the last five years and hugely um, taking the world by storm, uh, open banking is has gone even faster. I believe that the next move to um, financial data being open and used in whatever front end is the most personal and the most familiar to you is what the, what the open data economy is about. Uh, so we've moved beyond, I think even in the last a few months, we've moved beyond um, uh, API banking and multi-banking and we're now in an open data economy. And uh, that's where uh, open banking, open source, and I guess an open mind is going to show us who the next winners are. And thank you very much for your time.